All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the sixth uh, virtual training session of the New Jersey 4-H Pollinator Habitat Ambassadors. Um, we are joined by um, Blake Moore, as well as Liz Allen. They're from the, um, they are from, <laughs> the UD Cooperative Extension. The UD Cooperative Extension. Yep. Yeah. Delaware Master Naturalist Program. You got it. So I'm sorry, I have Blake's bio. I don't have Liz's. So I'll okay. read Blake's quickly and then Liz, you can introduce yourself if that's okay. okay. All right. Blake Moore was born and raised in Sussex County, Delaware, spending his youth in the small town of Bridgeville. He's a military veteran and we thank him for his service in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. He served from May 2004 to November 2005. After returning from service, he graduated from the University of Delaware in 2007 with a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resource Management. He's worked in the private sector and also as a noxious weed specialist in the Delaware Department of Ag's plant industry section. He is a certified nutrient consultant, a certified crop advisor, and a lead Delaware alumnus. And he's been with Delaware Cooperative Extension since 2019. So welcome. Thank you. Liz, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I can introduce myself. So my name's Liz Allen. I'm a Delaware Master Naturalist. And uh, I also am an educator at Mount Cuba Center, which is a botanical garden that focuses on natives. And uh, I also have a small business where I do invasive removal and uh, plan gardens and do all the work related to making a garden. And uh, being obsessed, I have also converted my whole yard. This is my backyard <laughs> to a native pollinator garden. And um, I used to be a teacher. I used to teach high school ESL, uh, but that was a, a long time ago. I did it for about a decade and now I've moved into the plant world. So. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for being with us. So I'm, I'm going right. to hand it over to Blake and Liz. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for having us. We're really excited to talk about this. This is something that, you know, I've always, you know, growing up as a kid, I always was interested in, in insects and bees and, and just anything I could find in my yard. I lived in town, uh, in the small town of Bridgeville in Delaware, but I still found so many things to get involved with that I was just so excited um, to always just explore. And then as I got into my career, um, as you heard, I was in the private sector and I moved into state service. Now I'm working with the University of Delaware Cooperative Extension. And so now I get to have the same fun uh, that I had as a kid. So I'm really happy to share with you guys today uh, a little bit of presentation about pollinators, which you probably have um, some experience with so far. And then we'll also talk about how to maintain plots. And if my PowerPoint... You double click. Okay, we are recording. All right. So thank you guys for joining us today. I'd love to talk to you about uh, pollinators and some successful created habitat. Here, uh, you guys have been working on becoming pollinator habitat stewards, which is awesome. I love hearing that. I think, you know, the next generation, you guys are really going to be the ones to help us bring this to the mainstream, help uh, help our state and, and government buildings adopt this a little bit more and have it in a landscape um, to help pollinators out. So I'll do a really quick um, uh, overview of pollination and pollinators, uh, and then we'll go into some more of the, the details on on kind of some things to think about when you're when you're planning uh, your plot and then how to maintain it over time. Um, so by now you guys probably know what pollination is. It is uh, when pollen that is coming from the anther of a flower is received by the stigma and it goes down and um, fertilizes the the flower to create uh, whatever fruit the plant is is trying to do to create seeds for reproduction. I won't go into more detail than that, but that's the basic of it. And so there's two types of pollination. Um, there's self pollination, which plants have the ability to pollinate themselves with no vector. So while we're looking at this this picture here, this is a, a carpenter bee on a black chokeberry uh, flower. And black chokeberry is a self pollinating plant. 
So this bee is not required for the, the survival of this plant, but it's still providing that food for, for the carpenter bee. Um, and it's, it's good to keep them um, surviving and healthy, um, but that chokeberry does pollinate on its own. You also have cross-pollination. And what cross-pollination is, is that there, there needs to be a vector. So the plant parts are, are the re reproductive parts on the flower are not in the same flower, and sometimes they're not even on the same plant. Um, that's where you'll see monoecious and dioecious below. And so monoecious means that male and female flowers are on the same plant. And I'll show you some examples of that in, in slides coming up. And then you have dioecious plants, which are uh, plants that have either male or female flowers. So you'll have um, you know, a tree that needs to have male and female trees, which is almost impossible to tell when the tree is not plant, when the tree is not flowering, uh, to be able to have successful pollination and, uh, and fruiting and survival. And so what are some examples? So monoecious, everybody knows what sweet corn is, right? Everybody knows what corn is, field corn. Um, you know, this time of year, I just got a fresh batch of sweet corn coming in. And so um, corn is actually a monoecious plant. So you see the tassels about this time of year in Delaware. I'm not sure if you guys are a little bit behind in Jersey, but um, when you see the tassels of the, of the corn plant, that's the male flower. That's where all the pollen is. And so that, that actual flower then will hit the silks here. If you see the silks on the right side of the screen, um, that is what collects the, um, the, the pollen. And each one of those silks is connected to um, a kernel. So that, that's where you get your kernels from. And so then in order for that plant to survive, it has to have that, that connection. And so you know, part of it could be windblown. Most of it is going to be windblown where you want to plant the, the corn in bunches so that the wind can blow the, the pollen from the male flower down to the silks in order to, uh, to pollinate. Dioecious is our next um, type of plant. And here on the left, you see my cursor. This is an, an English holly plant. I wanted to, uh, to show the difference between here because American hollies, which is the state tree for Delaware, has male and female flowers on different trees. So you'll need, if you wanna have a successful fruiting tree, you'll need to have a male tree and a female tree within a considerable amount of distance between each other. I don't know the exact difference, but they have to be within flying distance between the, the pollinators that are gonna be uh, helping this tree out. And so you can see here, um, the male flower for this holly on the left side, I'm circling it now with the with the cursor, you'll see the stamens here, and that's where the pollen is going to be found. And then on a different tree, you'll have to find the, fle the female flower, which looks a little bit more like this. And so without pollinators, without um, bees and butterflies or whatever else is, is um, you know, feeding on, on the flowers of the American holly, and in this case, the English holly, you can't have successful pollination. And so that's why sometimes you may see a, a tree that's been planted in the yard and never has berries on it. Um, and that's just because you don't have the, the proper, um, you know, you have, you don't have both um, sexes of the tree. And so that's a tough one. So when you go to plant holly trees, I guess the best bet would be to make sure that you're picking these trees when, uh, when it's flowering. Uh, there may be some other tips, but the main way to tell is based on the flower. On the right side here, um, we have the um, persimmon. It's a native tree that actually creates an orange-like fruit. And they have also the, the two different types of flowers. On the left here, you can see these are stamens in the male flower. And on a different separate tree, and that's where you need your pollinators here, you have the female flower. So we know what pollination is. We know what the two types of pollination. So now what is doing the heavy lifting? What are our pollinators? You can see in the top left, we have our wasps. We have a variety of different wasps out there. And even though they may be big and scary with their stingers coming around, they do a good service in pollination. You have your flies on the right side. Even house flies sometimes are, are pollinators for, for some, some plants. And some specialize in that, which we'll talk about a little bit later. You also obviously have your butterflies and your moths. Then you have your solitary bees which I think you've been learning about as well. And then you have your, bunny, your, your bumblebees and, and honeybees forming colonies. What else are pollinators? 
Well, we also have certain types of bats that are pollinators across the world. You can see here we have some birds. It's a hard picture to see on the top left, but that's a hummingbird in my yard visiting my coral honeysuckle. Ants are another one. Um, we may not think of ants as, as pollinators, but sometimes they actually do serve that purpose. Uh, reptiles and amphibians sometimes will serve that purpose, and also the, the several mammals will do the same, such as lemurs in different parts of the world. But mainly what you're going to find doing the heavy lifting is going to be your insects. And so why pollen? You know, what are we, what, why is pollen such a, a big thing for insects and, and pollinators? Well, a lot of them use pollinators or pollen for food source. It's, it's a protein rich and they use it to feed themselves and feed their young. Then you ask yourself, well, do all pollinators use pollen? They do not. So a lot of times uh, pollinators will visit the flower for the purpose of sipping nectar as the butterflies are. Butterflies do not eat pollen. Um, but they visit flowers and they get pollen on their legs when they're visiting to sip nectar. That's where you find that that butterflies are not as good of a pollinator as your bee species because of the hairs that the bees have uh, to carry pollen there. And also they're collecting it for, for use, most of the bees are. And so now we want to talk about how do these plants attract pollinators because we have to get them there uh, in order to have the pollination take place. You know, color is some things. You can see that there's all different types of color flowers. Some are attracted to yellows or reds. You have shape. And so you have different uh, lengths of tongues on certain pollinators, whereas butterflies are having a longer uh, a proboscis. And then you also have a uh, bees. Some of the bees have a, a, a longer tongue than others. And so bumblebees is a good example of that. And you'll see some pictures later on about how bumblebees are going to be um, attracted to certain types over, over others. And the same thing with some of your, your shorter tongue bees. They're not going to be able to, they're not going to be able to, to sit in nectar or gather out of this, this flower down here, which is a, a scarlet bee balm. Um, but our ruby-throated hummingbird certainly can and certainly is attracted to this type of, of shape and color. Fragrance is another one. So here on the right side, you probably have not seen this flower ever in person, but this is the flower of a skunk cabbage, which is a native plant that grows into in some of our wooded wetland areas and some of the first things to bloom every year. And obviously it's going to have a pretty, uh, pretty nasty fragrance to it. And that's why it's got its name, the skunk cabbage. But this is something where it's actually going to, to attract flies and, and other types of things that are attracted to that type of smell. Obviously, there's some good fragrances as well out there that will attract other types of pollinators. And then also nectar. So again, as we talked about earlier, how butterflies are coming to the plant for the nectar and not necessarily the pollen. And so that's, that's how they've, they've, uh, they do that trick. So flowers have their ways to get pollinators to them and make sure that they're gonna, gonna help them survive and, and reproduce. So now that we've got that basic covered, let's talk about your, your successful pollinator habitats. Again, I really think it's great that you guys are taking on this mission to become pollinator habitat stewards because it's, it's not a new concept, but it's definitely a newer mission where, where a lot of folks are getting involved in this and just trying to figure out the best ways to protect our pollinators who are coming to these areas that are gonna be stressful areas because there's not as much protection, there's not as much variety, um, you know, and it's a it's it's an area that we've got to try to provide as much as we can for for their survival. So some of the things that you're going to need to make sure that there's successful pollinator habitat is food sources. So as we mentioned, pollinators feed on nectar, they feed on pollen, but then you also are going to need to make sure that you have foliage for the larvae. Um, you've see, you guys have I've heard that you've learned about the monarch butterfly, and yet you know that the, the monarch needs milkweeds and and mainly for the fact that the larvae are gonna feed on the foliage of the milkweed plant. So, you know, we have to have those food sources there available. And again, as we talked about, you're gonna need a variety of flower shapes in order to do that. So when you're selecting your species, trying to figure out the different shapes is, is definitely something you should, should key in on. And I'll give you some examples in a little bit. Uh, you also wanna provide nesting sites. Um, so rigid stems, uh, left year round. You'll see a few of my uh, examples later on 
of some some of the the flower species that have some pretty rigid stems and if you can leave them standing um, they are used as nesting sites for some of your some of your um, solitary bees also loose dirt and leaf litter for ground nesting bees and butterflies and moths um, loose dirt there will be a lot of, of native bee species that do um, create their their nests in loose dirt areas so they kind of avoid some of those heavily maintained lawns and things like that because there's too much compaction there's too much going on there so if you have a spot in your yard or maybe at your school that just has some more loose dirt there or some leaf litter uh, it's a good it's a good idea to try to leave that um, and then for the leaf litter, especially, there's a lot of, of different types of moths and some butterflies that actually have their their larvae will actually do their metaf metamorphosis over the winter time in that leaf litter. Uh, water sources, sometimes we might not think about that, but we should have some type of water source for our, our pollinators. Um, they'll need that uh, for survival and reproduction. And then we'll talk about also varying bloom times. So you want to try to have as much of the growing season covered with blooms as you can. Um, and that goes from variety selection. So, you know, trying to find, um, you know, certain species that bloom earlier in the year. I, I tend to find that shrubs and trees are some of the more early bloomers. That's not the rule all across the board, but a lot of times I try to incorporate some shrubs and some trees in the, in the vicinity of your pollinator plot uh, to help with that early season. And I'll give you some examples as well. So I did kind of a timeline here. So the next couple of slides are gonna be really kind of showing the things that I have in my yard or some things that I encounter um, that, that just cover as much of the growing season as possible. And so all the way on the left here, you'll see there's a small, I believe that's a bumblebee or a carpenter bee visiting an Eastern redbud. Eastern redbud is a great uh, tree that's native to the region. And it blooms, I think I took this picture in April, it's mid April, I think April 12th. And, you know, it's within that vicinity, sometimes earlier, sometimes a little bit later, and you get about two weeks of blooms, two to three weeks of, of blooms on the eastern redbud. Just one example, um, you know, and I go out there and I take videos every year to see what's visiting, and I'm always finding a bunch of different types of pollinators there. Um, you know, mainly carpenter bees and honeybees, see quite a few honeybees on the eastern redbud as well. Um, I don't, you know, again, these species are there, they're providing the food source. I don't know the, the full quality on all these plants of what that food source is, but it, just giving those options there for some of that early season uh, flower bloom is, is definitely important. Um, in the middle, we have a black chokeberry, which is a native shrub. This picture was taken on May 8th, I believe, and I think this one was taken in 2020. But again, this, this one blooms for a couple of weeks around that time frame. So now you had that transition from from the eastern red bud is there now the the um the black chokeberry is there and so now that 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 gives a transition to the third one which also blooms around the same time early may this is golden alexander um you'll see a, an option of this later or an example of this later of how the foliage is also used um, by pollinators reproducing um, and, and so you have a different color each one of these is a different color different shape and just just being there as an option for food source it's a little blurry, but in the center here, this is one of those green metallic sweat bees um, that's that's visiting this golden Alexander. And if you can see the rest of the plot, like there's still some dormant plants there. There's not a whole other, a lot of other flowers that are that are blooming at that time. So really having that early season blooms is pretty important. So when you're selecting, trying to find the earliest blooming periods that you can, and then go from there and kind of create your timeline. And so next. We move on into a little bit more in late May. I've got clethra over here on the left and some early sunflower on the right. And so both of these are, are about, I'd say, mid-May, uh, getting into June. So it kind of picks up where the black chokeberry and the golden alexander leave off. And now you have um, some more uh, options for pollinators there. Kind of keeps it there for them. Um, those options are, are critical. I mean, if you if you think about them, going weeks without any kind of, of source of, of, of food, nectar, pollen, you know, that can really be critical to the survival of, of your, your species locally. And then we move a little bit later into June and July. Uh, you can see on the left here, um, 
This is my dog, Aisha. She is a Rhodesian Ridgeback. Wonderful dog. I had to put her in here because she's just posing. Um, but this is my little wildlife area or wild area that I like to call it in my backyard. And this is in, uh, this is recent. I think this was about late June, mid to late June, picking up where the, uh, the clethra left off. And now you have uh, an option. This here is, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank. I know what it is. It is elderberry. That's right. So this is elderberry. And elderberry is actually a pretty, um, a flexible tree or shrub. It's a small, small tree shrub. Um, it can grow in wetland areas. It actually probably prefers that. I'm growing it upland in my yard. Um, seems to do pretty well, uh, though it does stay a little bit moist back there in that little wild area. So that's the blooms that are picking up where where the clether left off. And just for, for references, this right here where my cursor is on these two corners is where that picture of clether was taken. And in the middle is where the golden Alexander was. So I've had blooms in all locations so far. This is picking up there. And then um, next to that, you'll see examples here. There's there's uh, Joe pie weed I have back here that's not bloomed yet. I think it's it's blooming now, but it hadn't been blooming back in June. And there's some iron weed and other things like that that'll bloom a little bit later in the season. So it's a little overcrowded. I don't I don't suggest. Uh, crowding your plot kind of like that, but still kind of just showing those different times uh, of blooms that's going to be helpful. A different part of my yard, I have some wild bergamot, which is a mint, a native mint, and it is those longer tongue bees are going to like this this uh, flower. It, it, they're going to need that because the nectar is kind of down in that in that in that flower tube, and and that's going to be helpful with them. This was taken. Uh, you can see it just here. This is a bumblebee here. Um, they are usually loaded up with those, and those blooms come around uh, about this time of year. They're probably, they've probably been blooming for about a week, so I'd say end of June um, and through through July into August, these, these flowers will be blooming, and they actually might be even later than that. And next is the Trumpet Creeper Vine, another native vine that, that grows. It is aggressive, I will warn you, but um, if there are any areas that you feel like you can stick some, some vines in, there's some pretty pretty uh, good vine uh, selections that are native to this area. Um, but this one will start blooming um, end of June, and it'll actually bloom all the way through October. So this is a nice long powerhouse towards the end of the season. Hold on, let me go back one real quick. And so this one obviously is a favorite for, for your hummingbirds. So hummingbirds love this. And this is actually um, covered in ants right now as well. So it's not something you necessarily want close to your house, but it's in the back corner of my yard and the ants are actually in these flowers um, using the nectar. Don't know exactly how well pollinators they are, um, but just knowing that, you know, this is an example that, that ants are using the nectar there. I've also seen squirrels eating those flowers. Had no idea that that, that was a thing, um, but apparently sometimes um, squirrels can have a taste for that. So next we have that are blooming. Uh, these are actually the longer blooming flowers that I have in my yard. Um, so this is butterfly milkweed. I'm sure you guys have heard of this one so far. It's a really good one for monarchs, but it's also good um, a good flower for, for the, the length of time that it blooms. Like this flower is blooming in, I, I wanna say early June and it'll go, I know that it goes into October, uh, early October, depending on, on how Far north you are but this is something where all year round this is going to be an option for your for your pollinators especially through the hot uh hot portion of the summer um, where you might not have as many options and then this is another vine um it's not quite as aggressive as the trumpet creeper vine but this is actually your native honeysuckle coral honeysuckle any honeysuckle that you see that's white uh and yellow most of the time that's an invasive species whether it's a um type of bush honeysuckle that's not native to this area and is also invasive, or there's a Japanese uh, vine honeysuckle that's also invasive as well. Um, so this is an option that if you have an area that that uh, you can have vines in, um, coral honeysuckle is, is great. Hummingbirds love this, um, and there's also some, some specialist um, insects that use this for reproduction as well. And this one actually uh, this vine here, I kind of let it grow into sort of a shrub, and I actually fledged two mockingbirds from there last year. Uh, they laid an, uh, they had a nest in there, which, you know, my dogs, you saw the one, I have three of them, 
they were all around there, but the protection was so good that uh, they were able to complete their life cycle there, which was great. So not only were we helping the pollinators, we're helping our birds as well. All right, so now we got kind of the, the, the timing kind of figured out, and we know that we want to have the, the most um, time covered during the growing season as we can with different types of flowers and what time they bloom. And I'll just mention here on the right is, is one of the many species of goldenrods. A lot of goldenrods and asters are late blooming um, species that are really important for late season pollinator forage. Um, you know, it, I, I believe they start blooming and, not, and most species of goldenrod and aster are blooming, you know, late July, early August, and they, they are going to cover up into to dormancy uh, into the fall. So they're a really good one to have. But you can see the different types of flower shapes you have here. Again, as we talked about earlier, the trumpet creeper, you know, you're going to need a, you know, this is going to be more enticing to, to uh, a hummingbird than a honeybee. Um, on the top left, this is a two-spotted longhorn bee. It's a native, uh, native bee to our area, and it's a longer tongue bee, and it needs it needs those flower shapes in order to attract them to it, and so they can they can feed on the nectar in those flower tubes. Don't see honeybees on on the wild bergamot uh, because they don't have the the longer tongue that's going to get down there. We also have your black eyed Susan in the bottom left. This is a good one because it's got a nice little landing pad. It's kind of sitting there with uh, easy access and, and uh, just begging for, for, for bees to come in. Uh, nectar and pollen is going to be available there. Um, so just having a variety of shapes of flowers is important as well. As we mentioned earlier, foliage for reproduction, extremely important. Um, one of the things I'll mention a little bit later on, but I'll cover it now as well, is is oak trees. There are certain species of oak trees that are the larval host to approximately 200 to 300 different species of pollinators in our areas. Um, I, I challenge you to look up some of the research done by Dr. Doug Tallamy here at the University of Delaware um, on that, on, on um, determining what types of oak trees are really, really powerhouses and, and supporting pollinators through their foliage for reproduction. Um, obviously, here on the left, we have the monarch larva. It, I took this in my yard on that butterfly weed. It was probably the same one that you, you saw earlier, but this is obviously last year into October, and um, we had some butterfly larvae there. Interesting story. Um, when I moved into my house, I live in town, Milford, Delaware. Um, when I moved in, there was absolutely nothing there. Like, there was no plantings there, really. We had some around the house, but in the grand scheme of things, there wasn't a whole lot there. And so the first year I put in some milkweeds, I put in some other uh, native plants to get started. And in the back corner of my yard, the swamp milkweed, the very first year was loaded with monarch, um, with monarch uh, larva. And, and so it just goes to show where there used to be nothing, just giving a little bit of love and a little bit of space for, for some of these native plants, we were able to support uh, reproducing monarch butterflies. On the right, we have the black swallowtail. Um, this is the larva for that. And it's actually on one of those golden alexanders. We showed you that the golden alexander was blooming back in uh, in May, uh, early May timeframe, but the foliage is there and black swallowtails will use that um, as feeding for, for reproduction. Um, this was obviously, this was also taken in October of last year. Um, so, you know, the, the, the flowers and the, the um, selection of, of the shapes and timings is really important, but I'm also selecting species that are going to support the, um, the reproduction of, of our pollinators as well. <clears throat> so nesting sites. So on the left here, this is my one of my other dogs. It's a boy. His name's Koa. He's huge. He's awesome. And he's sitting there posing in front of my wildlife area that I have. Um, but this is in February. So you can see it still looks a little messy. So again, I'm not suggesting that you keep your pollinator plots looking this, this messy, but the point here really is to kind of point out that there's dormant stems that are there that are gonna be used as nesting sites for bees. Similar to what you see in the center, how you can do your bee boxes and things like that. I challenge you to take a look at some of the, 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 um, the makeups of those because you can make those on your own. You can buy them at the store, but the dormant stems are really what serving that purpose um, in, in nature, right? So if we leave that there, they're going to be used for that purpose. 
and all the way on the right, you can't really see it, but this is some, this is dormant switchgrass. And that is the same thing that's right here. It's actually the same plant. This is in May, but this thing, I took a video and I tried to take a picture, but you can't see it because it's so small. But right here, going into that entrance is one of our uh, native solitary bees. I don't know exactly what kind it was, but this plant was loaded with them. They were flying everywhere. They were obviously using those dormant stems. If I had cut them and removed them, you know, I would, I removed, you know, countless number of, of, you know, whether it's just resting habitat there for them or whether it's nesting sites, um, you know, I, I was removing that from them. Another cool thing is, is that every winter I like to go out back and, and take a look at what's using the yard still. Birds are in and out of that little section there all the time, even with my dogs there, um, you know, eating the seeds that are left that are left standing on those dormant stems. They're also bedding down in there sometimes in order to, to keep away from the weather. Um, you know, it's just really awesome to see in the middle of town where something where nothing used to exist there. And now we're able to create that habitat for, for not only pollinators, but some of our bird species as well. All right. So now we've got our plot. Now we've got our plants selected. We're gonna have blooms starting at the end of March and early April, and it's gonna go all the way to October. Sometimes we get lucky into November a little bit, depending on the weather. And so we've kept we, we've kept up our end of the bargain. We've we provided the food sources, we provided the nesting source, the nesting sites. We've we've got everything in place to make sure that we have some successful pollinator habitat. So now we've got to maintain those plots. And as you see, my, my maintenance on my own personal plots is a little less than say some of your more traveled areas because you're gonna still need to make sure that uh, the plots look nice because obviously some folks think that, you know, it looks a little messy. You know, for me, it's peaceful for, for others, um, it may not be so. Um, so first thing, getting the, the, the plot established and heavily Planted. I really suggest trying to, if you're doing any kind of plot, just trying to fill as much of the area as you can. Um, helps with weed control, also helps uh, with, with more um, protection for, for the pollinators when they're visiting the area, less predation, things like that. Um, so once, once it's established, uh, most native plants are going to have really deep uh, root, root systems, so you're not going to need to water this area a lot. I just say, you know, keep, keep your eye on it, and if you're seeing any of the species start to wilt, um, you know, then maybe get some water on it, but really just kind of, you know, watering when you first plant for, for until they're established, you know, the watering requirements for those areas is not as much. One of the things I ran into this year, I planted a plot in a park that, that does not have water access to it. So that's another thing you want to think about if you're going to need to water those sites is how you're going to do that. I selected buying a sprayer, um, you know, that's usually, that's normally used for herbicides and I got a big enough one that's battery power that I'm using just for water. Um, and that seems to have been worked out pretty well for us. It's a smaller site. So if you're having a bigger site done, um, you know, you may be different. And now mind you, most of these plots that I'm talking about right now are established through plugs. So I'm talking about smaller plug, uh, smaller plots that have been uh, established with plugs. If you're doing bigger ones, like bigger meadows and things like that, that's a whole nother set of things. But for pollinator uh, habitat stewards, the things that I believe that we're doing, um, plugs is usually the way to go. And this is the type of thing that we can take, we can do to make sure they're successful. Um, so if you do have an area that's a little bit more traveled and you need to keep it looking a little bit more, more neat, um, if you do have to trim those dormant stems, try to wait as long as you can. Like try to wait into the spring, early spring, late winter, if you can, to try to leave as much of the seeds on the stems as possible for birds to eat and also for some areas to reseed as well. And if you have to, if you have to end up trimming, um, try to leave 18 to 24 inches of some of those rigid stems there because there may already be some, some bees in there that are, that are nesting and just trying to protect them and, and let them uh, finish their cycle would be, it's pretty important. And if you do have to, if you do end up cutting, you know, if you can leave it on the site, you know, I have, um, some of my colleagues have seen those cuttings still be used, even though they're laying on the ground. Um, so if you can do that, that's, that's an awesome thing to do. So the bee houses we talked about earlier. I know you've probably seen some some pictures out there, some really massive bee hotels. That's not the best way to do it, because it's basically putting all the the um, you know the the bee larvae and the other things like in one place for whether a predator wants to come there for for a buffet 
or if a disease or, or some type of parasite gets into the, that spot, then it puts every one of them at risk. So if you are going to put some bee houses in there, um, you know, pick a couple small ones and, and put them throughout your plot, uh, making sure they're protected from the elements as best possible. Um, and then also you're going to want to, you want to kind of clean them out every, every so often, um, you know, to prevent some disease and things like that. And I, you know, I replace mine every couple of years as well because they start to fall apart and they're not as protected. And then just monitor, you know, for weeds, invasive plants, things like that. Um, but it's really, you know, it's really important to, uh, you know, plan these plots out, you know, which I, I, I'm sure you guys are putting a lot of effort into this and just trying to, to use some of these tips we talked about earlier to do a pretty good plan to put in place, um, you know, because starting off strong is going to help you with uh, the long term success of the plots. And, you know, thinking about, you know, when you're creating these plots, you're creating the habitat for a variety of pollinators. Beneficial predatory insects is something that's really important as well. Like lady beetles, praying mantis, lace wings, they feed on some of those pest insects that that uh, a lot of homeowners will actually, you know, treat their, their houses with, with uh, insecticides. Some of these predatory insects can help keep those populations down a little bit. Don't want to eradicate them, but it helps in the long run. Um, and then, you know, so the habitat is, you know, it's not just for pollinators, it's for birds and some small mammals are going to use it as well. Remember about trees and shrubs, if you have the, the space to be able to put some of those smaller species like eastern red bud trees, fringe tree is another one, um, you know, and then some of your shrubs, because they're going to be, a lot of those are going to be your early blooming um, varieties of plants. Um, they also are going to be uh, a good place for, for protection and also some of the tree species, some of the bigger ones are going to be really powerhouses and, and uh, supporting pollinator larvae. Um, and then it's really, you know, you guys are, are committed. You guys are becoming pollinator habitat stewards. So that long-term commitment is, is huge. And building that right team is, is what you need in order, you know, to, to have long-term success and really be able to to prop these, uh, prop these uh, areas up and, and have, you know, because we, we, we run into a lot of times where, you know, if we don't have the commitment, you know, these plots go away, you know, after a lot of work has been put in and uh, the next, the next team that comes along may not want to keep them. So really trying to do as long-term commitment as possible is, is, is key to help uh, make sure that we can, we can uh, keep these in place. And that's all I have for today. Again, um, didn't go as, as deep as I could have, but I hope this kind of gives you a, a good place to start thinking about, um, you know, what, what goes into planning, uh, putting in a pollinator plot, and then what, what some of the, the key things are for, for uh, making it successful and maintaining it long term. I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen in case anybody is here and has any questions. Right, we do have two, um, we have two pollinator habitat ambassadors on the line and please feel free to unmute and pop a question in the chat. I made a note to myself that when I, um, actually, I'm gonna stop recording after I say this. When I share the recording, I'm going to really focus on um, 2020 about maintenance, year long maintenance. And um, I've also been a part of projects where there were complaints about um, appearance, you know, people think messy or whatever it is. So I think knowing that going in and having a maintenance plan, I encourage all pollinator habitat ambassadors listening to have that maintenance plan to make it now. It's exciting to install. I mean, it's exciting all year round, but um, they, they have made a commitment for, um, for the year at least and, and beyond. So I am gonna stop recording. Um,